It's going to sound so loud, one day it awakes the dead. In the twinkling of an eye, he'll split the eastern sky, and I believe he's coming back, like he said. And I believe he's coming back, like he said. I believe that the trumpet's going to sound so loud, one day it awakes the dead. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading. James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses of James chapter 1. Not a lengthy passage, so we'll just read it in unison this morning. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 of James chapter 1. And as our custom usually is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of James chapter 1. Ready? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful music today. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit that's in this room this morning. Thank you for each one that's made their way to the service today. And Lord, we ask you now to speak to our hearts when it comes as we open up your word together, Lord, I'm praying that you'll bless the special, that it will tune our heart to your heart, that you'll help us to clear our mind from distractions and things that would occupy our thoughts and uh, allow us not to hear the still small voice of the Spirit of God. So Lord, minister to us now and prepare our hearts to be ready to receive the truth from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might see. And the light that shines in darkness now will safely lead us o'er. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, the ship would be no more. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him. For Jesus is a lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shone a light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? Everybody that lives around us, they say, tear that old lighthouse down. For the big ships, they don't sail this way anymore. There's no use in it standing round. But then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time I saw the light. Yes, the light from that old lighthouse that stands up there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him. For Jesus is a lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? Amen. Sure, I got this on. Father, we thank you now for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful salvation that we have through Jesus Christ and what you have provided for us. Thank you for so loving the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now Lord, we come to open up your word this morning and Father, I'm asking for your help as I bring this message today. Please keep my mind clear from distraction and a Help me to be able to clearly communicate the truth that you have for us today from your word. Please help the listener this morning that they'll listen carefully. And each of us would hear what the Spirit would want to say to each one of us today. Lord, I pray that we'll leave in a little bit saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. God spoke to my heart. So may you hear our prayer today and may you answer it according to your will. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about what James calls here the trying of your faith, or what we would say the testing of our faith. God tests our faith. You know, one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible is Hebrews 11.6. For without faith it is impossible to please God. They that, they that come to God must believe that God is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith. Faith. How many, how many parents in the room this morning? Let me see your hand. Okay, quite a few. How many parents are happy when your children trust you? Hmm? Sure. And uh, there's times that you have to look at your children and say, Trust me on this. And it's a wonderful thing when they trust you on that. You know, it's a great thing when God looks down and we trust Him as our Father. Good morning. 
Come on in. Got a place for you there in the second row. There you go. That's good. You know, you can do the right thing with God and still not please Him if you do not do it in faith. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So even doing something right, but not doing it in faith, would be wrong. Everything we do, we're to do by faith. So that's why the Bible says, the just shall live by faith, not by sight. So faith becomes very, very important to our life. If we're going to talk how important faith is, then I'm thinking of the disciples when they asked Jesus this question, they said, Lord, increase our faith. If I'm to walk by faith, if everything I'm supposed to do by faith, if I don't do it by faith, it's sin, then I, I, I want to have more faith. And, and if faith is what pleases God, then I want to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to please God, so I have to have faith. And if it pleases God for me to have faith, it will please God if I have more faith. Now how do I increase my faith? How do you get more faith? I mean, is there a, is there a secret to it? Is there some kind of therapy I go to and I can get more faith? Is there a seminar somewhere that I can attend and I can go away having more faith? Is there a pill I can take that will give me more faith and, 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 and help me? No, there really isn't. And, and the, the, the secret is, and, and the truth is, what I'm going to tell you, how God builds your faith, how God grows your faith, is, is something you probably won't like when you first hear it. God builds our faith by testing our faith. By trying our faith is what James says. Faith, faith is like a muscle. And, and as you stretch it and you work it, it gets stronger. You develop your muscles. Brother, Brother Yoder lifts weights. You can tell that. Buff guy that he is. But he wore, the other morning at breakfast, he had a t-shirt on. And of course, you know, his muscles were bulging out there. And Brother, Brother Woods felt his arm and said, you, you work out. And, of course, I know he works out. He's got a whole weight set, whole weight room in his basement there that I know he works out. And he develops those muscles. You don't get muscles like that if you don't develop them. If he could, I could have the same weight room in my basement, but I wouldn't look the same because I don't use it. Okay? It's like that exercise equipment in your house that has the clothes hanging on it. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's kind of how that works. So your faith is developed and, 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 and it's tested. Your faith gets developed when it gets tested. James, verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Boy, that's a good word, isn't it? We all have plenty of that. No need to develop any patience in our lives. If you think you need patience, just go out to dinner today. You'll be exercising patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. That means you'll be mature and complete, wanting or lacking nothing. The purpose of testing our faith is so that our patience will grow, and will mature and become complete, well-rounded believers. That's what God desires for each one of us. Now every day we have opportunities then to build our faith. The problem is most of us don't recognize them. We don't see it as that. And so we, we flunk the test because we don't realize we're taking a test. We don't realize what God's doing in our life. That God's trying to help us to grow. 
There's four ways God will test our faith. I want to share that with you this morning. How does God test my faith so it can develop, so I can mature and be the kind of Christian God wants me to be? Well, there's four things, four ways that God does it. And listen, you're going to see this this next week. You may see one of them. You may see, you'll see all four of them. You may see all four of them in one day. I don't know how God will test your faith, but I think when you recognize what God's doing, it will help you to build your faith. Number one, God tests our faith by difficulties. You say, oh, preacher, man, he's testing mine then. Uh, he tests our faith by difficulties. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Would you please, you're in James, just turn to your right, right after the book of James, is 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, look with me at verse number 6, would you please? The Bible says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, <clears throat> though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith, that's the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he says, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations or different kinds of temptations, trials, and that's the testing of your faith. Difficulties. Testing our faith, proving our faith. Did you know nothing ever happens by accident in the life of a believer? We don't, we don't believe in accidents when you're a Christian. Now, it doesn't mean that things don't just happen. We're in a fallen world. And things happen, but, but everything that happens to a Christian is filtered by our Heavenly Father. He has allowed it to come into our life. He has allowed it to happen. Nothing comes into our life without God's permission. There are no accidents. There's two things. We don't think there's accidents. And by the way, there's no such thing as luck to a Christian. Somebody says, well, good luck. Well, i got more than that. I have God. I don't need luck. Amen? Amen? So nothing comes into your life without God's permission. But God gives us things to test our faith. When the Bible says diverse, it means all kinds of things. You know, if life were easy, if life was a paved road all the way with no potholes, who would need any faith? If we never had any difficulties, how, why would we need to have faith in God? We could, we could just go by our feelings. Sometimes, and oftentimes, listen, we're not here, by the way, we're not here to live our life by our feelings. How often our feelings can get us into trouble. Feelings stem from our heart, and our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And You have to be careful about trying to be guided by your feelings. God lets us know in Isaiah 48 and verse 10, He said this, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Interesting, that wording of that? The furnace of affliction. You say, what is that talking about, preacher? That's talking about when the heat's on. When, it, when, when the heat's on, it gets to be a, a real test. Somebody, somebody says, you're feeling the heat yet? It means you're in some trouble. Uh, used to be a saying, if you can't stay in the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, that's not, that's not biblical, by the way. But you're under pressure. Somebody said, oh, that happened to me and I got hot under the collar. We use those expressions. The, the furnace for the silver and the refining the silver would be heated up so the impurities would come to the top. And then they could skim those impurities out. You're getting a pure silver or a pure gold. And God will turn up the heat in our lives. 
to let the impurities come to the top. That's why when the heat's on and the pressure's on and people say things or they do things and you think, man, I shouldn't have said that. Boy, I wish I wouldn't have done that. No, that was just some of the impurity coming to the top. And God says, I want to scrape that off. I want you to, to give that to me. Because He's refining that out of us. The old silversmith who was burning away the impurities in his refining pot was asked, how can you tell when the impurities are all gone? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, I know they're gone when I can see my reflection in the silver. So how do you know when God's going to stop turning up the heat on me and getting the impurities out of my life? Oh, that's easy. When He sees the reflection of His Son in your life and my life. When He sees that we're being like Jesus. Now there's something else the Bible says if you're back in James chapter 1. So listen, you're going to go through difficulties. One of the, you know, God, I believe, you know, there's an old thing that says, you know, uh, God, has, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Or God is good and He has a wonderful plan for your life. And people start a plan of stories. And listen, God, God has a wonderful plan for your life if you receive Christ as your Savior. But I, wanna, I want you to understand something. That wonderful life can also, will include, not can include, it will include difficulties. Absolutely. You know, you don't, you don't always see that when you're young. But once you get down the road a few miles, you know there's difficulties. Remember me telling the story about the growing up in our uh, paper back home, the, the Canton Repository, they would always have athletes of the week. Brother Yoder might remember this on the back of the sports page, and they would highlight a girl athlete and a boy athlete, and they would ask them questions, you know, your favorite food and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But they always ask the last question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? You're 18, where do you see yourself at 28? And, and I used to kind of, as I got older and I'd look at that, I'd chuckle at that. And I wonder if you went back with that article to these kids 10 years later and said, here's where you thought you'd be, how'd that work out? Huh? And some of you are laughing because if, if someone would ask you 20 years ago, where do you see yourself at the age you are right now? You'd have never said where, where you are right now. <clears throat> some of you are in church this morning and you know Christ your Savior and you're living for God and listen, 10 years ago you'd have never saw that coming. God's changed your life completely. And praise the Lord for that. But you understand, there's difficulties that are going to come. So what am I supposed to do when difficulties come? Well, James tells us. You know what he says? My brethren, verse number 2, Grumble and complain when you fall into diverse temptations. No, that isn't what your Bible says? Murmur under your breath when you fall into diverse... Stay home from church when you fall into diverse... Maybe that's what it is. No, what did he say? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, that just, as the old preacher said, that just ain't natural. Okay? That's not what we want to do. What do we want to do? What's going on? Why is this happening to me? What's happening, God? But God says, no. I want you to count it all joy. Rejoice. Take it easy. Relax. Praise God. Praise God. Difficulties have come. Why? God's testing my faith. God's proving my faith in Him. God's purpose is is greater than any pain or problem or difficulty that I'm going through. If I want to learn to live by faith, I've got to learn to rejoice. Paul put it this way in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I've got to rejoice all the time. Now, it, it, James is saying, consider it joy when you get to go through problems. That's amazing. You say, well, I don't just see it. That's because it's faith, not sight. You don't go by what you see. You go by what you know God says. And so you rejoice in the situation. You know, the Bible says, in everything, give thanks. 
It doesn't say for everything, give thanks. So it's not saying if, if you've got cancer and you're battling cancer, it doesn't say I thank God for my cancer. No, but it says while you have cancer, in the cancer, you can still give thanks to God. You can, you, you can go through trials or financial difficulties or marital issues, and you can't thank God for those problems, but you can thank God in those problems. Because in those problems, God is working in your life. And I'm learning to live by faith. God uses difficulties. And so when I have difficulties and I have trials, I say, God, you're working in my life. God's involved in my life. Praise the Lord for that. God wants to do something with me. And so rejoice. It's not the, it's not the easy times of life that God builds us in. It's the hard times of life that God builds us in. So don't forget that. Let me give you the second way. Not only does He build our faith or test our faith through difficulties, but secondly, He does it through demands. God will ask us to do some things that are seemingly impossible. Now somebody has said, I did not verify this, but somebody has said there are 1,050 commands for believers to obey. Just in the New Testament. Okay? That's a lot. And some of them may seem a little difficult, a little tough. In fact, impossible. Impossible. What do you do when you have an impossible command that seems like a demand? They're there to test our faith. When I have a command and it seems like I can't do it, that it's impossible for me to carry out, then I have to ask myself, who am I going to believe? What I think or what God says? That's, that's where the rub comes down. Am I going to do what I think and what I feel and what I want or will I believe what God says? All the promises, all the commands of the Bible are there to test us. To test our faith. To see whether we'll just trust God and believe God. Some of them may seem simple, but they're not so easy. Be anxious for nothing. What's anxious? It means worry. You're not to worry about anything. You say, well, Pastor, I don't worry. I just get concerned. <laughs> yeah. To get around it, we just reword it. Say, ah, that'll work. Huh? No, 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 no. See, that, uh, you say, man, that's impossible. Who doesn't worry? Who doesn't have some anxious moments? Don't you know I have kids? Yeah. God says, will you, will you put your faith in me? It's a test. Am I going to trust God and do what He says or do what He says is right? Am I going to trust my own opinion and what I think is right? How many times have you caught yourself saying, well, yeah, I know the Bible says this, but you know, we're a but to do. <laughs> we're about to say what we think. Like that matters when God has made it a plain command. God is testing our faith by His commands, by His demands that He gives to us. You know, there's many examples in the Bible of people who God told them to do this and they just trusted Him and had faith even though it didn't make any sense to them. In fact, it seemed impossible to them. You know, the people of Israel on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land, God's going to feed them. And what God demanded them to do was He said, here's what I'm providing for you. It's a little round thing. Now, the Bible doesn't come right out and say this, but it had chocolate on the outside and cream on the inside. And <laughs> in the Hebrew, it was an Oreo cookie. I just want to tell you that. But uh, it was called manna. 
And, and he said, you're going to gather this manna every morning for six days. On the sixth day, you gather twice as much what you need for the Sabbath because you're not going to gather on the Sabbath day. And so every morning you go out and you gather what you need for that day. Now think about this. How many of you, be honest with me, will you? You're in church. Be honest enough to say, some of you would have thought, I think it's a better use of my time if I just gathered a week's worth. And I don't have to go out and do this thing every day. I can just spend a extra time today, and I'm done till next Monday. Huh? How many of you would have thought like that? Be honest. Yeah. You said, man, every day doing this? That's it. So now it's a test, isn't it? You're going to do what you think? Or will you do it exactly as I say? Now, God knew that there were people like, then, like you then. So what did God tell them? Yeah, some of you are going to try to gather more than what you need. You're going to gather up in your house. And uh, by about noon that day, what's going to happen to it? Yeah, it's going to go bad and breed worms and it's going to stink. And you're not going to want it around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you trust me. God says it's more important that every day you do what I've asked you to do than for you to devise it in your own head what you think is best to do. It's a test. I'm sure there were people there who thought I'd be better use of my time or what happens if I'm sick tomorrow? What happens if I trip today and fall and hit my head on a rock and I can't collect it tomorrow? What's going to happen, God? I'm sure they had all kinds of excuses. But God says, follow my commands. Why? Because I want to grow your faith. I want to grow your faith in me. So just do as I say. What about Abraham? Abraham was 75. When God told him, I want you to, to leave where you live and leave your kinfolk and, and travel to a country I'm going to tell you of later. I mean, here's Abraham, probably ready to hang it up. Got his retirement card in the mail, and he's ready to retire. And God says, you're not hanging it up, you're taking it down, and you're moving. Now you think about this. You're going to go somewhere where you've never been, and you don't even know where you're going. God says, well, God, exactly where am I going? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. Well, how will I know when I get there? Because I'm going to tell you. Well, would you obey a command like that? Wouldn't you say, well, God, give me an idea. At least I can Google it and see what it's like. <laughs> God, can I map quest this so I can at least have some direction here? After all, Sarah's going to want that. Imagine, imagine, wives, if your husband just comes and says, uh, we're taking a trip. In fact, the house is on the market and we're moving. Oh, great, where are we moving to? I don't know. Well, come on, you've got to have some idea. No, I don't. Just wherever God says. Now, ladies, think about it. How many of you would have said, hey, hot dog, let's go? You say, no, I think I need a little bit more information than this. Huh? Faith is always a risk. Faith is always a risk. You won't always play it safe and live by faith. And what, what's a risk? A risk means you don't know everything that's going to happen in advance. You've got to risk it. Why would God do that? Because God's not interested in making us comfortable. We are. We like comfort. We like air conditioning. We like padded seats. We like cars that have air conditioning on 93 degree Father's Day. We like comfort. God's not interested in our comfort. He's interested in our faith. And faith is never comfortable. He wants to grow our faith. You know what the Bible says about Abraham? By faith, Abraham obeyed. He went. He did exactly what God wanted. What about Noah? Noah? Going to build an ark? Noah said, God, I live in a desert. 
Well, it's going to rain. What's that? It never rained. Water came up from the ground and watered everything. Imagine him even telling people it's going to rain, it's going to flood. They thought, Noah, you, you got problems, bud. Huh? I'm building an ark. I, I've never seen rain. I've never seen a flood. I've never seen anything you're talking about. But the Bible says, by faith, Noah built the ark. Prepared ark to the saving of his household. By faith. He just did what God said, even though it didn't make any sense to him. He makes demands on our lives that don't make sense to us. But listen, we do it because we trust Him. That's what He wants. If I'm going to live by faith, if God's going to grow my faith, then I have to learn to rejoice continually and obey immediately. Obey immediately. When God's Word tells you something, obey it. That's it. That's why the first principle in the RU recovery program is if God's against it, so am I. You have to agree with God that what He says is wrong is wrong. What He says is right is right. Because we rationalize what we want to do. And we rationalize it. It's not so bad. Well, I know other people to do it. Well, I'm not as bad as those people are. And we rationalize it away. Instead of saying, God says it's wrong, it's wrong. So how does God stretch our faith or grow our faith? By difficulties? By demands? You ready for number three? He tests our faith and stretches our faith with dollars. You say, now you're talking preacher. Yeah, I know. Did you know that money is always one of the greatest tests of faith in your life? Always. God God will use material possessions as a test of our faith. And finances are often the greatest test of all. God's testing us in the area of finances. People go through financial problems, financial difficulties, and then they're asked to give. Faith. Jesus said in Luke 16, 11, If ye therefore have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So in other words, the, the, what Jesus is saying is there's a direct correlation to how well I'll handle money, material things, and how well I'll handle Spiritual things. And truths from God. There's a correlation there. I didn't make that correlation. Jesus did. Jesus linked those two together. Money is a test. If I'm not faithful with my material possessions, how can God trust me to be faithful with spiritual possessions? If I'm not faithful in that which is least, how will I be faithful in that which is much? The truth is, what we do with our money really determines what God can do with our life. How faithful are we with what God puts into our hands? You see, every time we sit down and you write your check out for for the tithe, for the Lord's tithe, or for an offering, or for missions, whatever it may be, and you write that out, and and you know that that's money you might be able to use to pay bills, it's a test of faith. There's no way you sit down and say, okay, how can how can you know nine hundred dollars go further than a thousand? How can ninety go further than a hundred? How does that work? It only works by faith. There's no there's no sense to it. It's just faith. Yet I could go around this room today and hear testimony after testimony after testimony of people who say it it, it works exactly like that. It's exactly how God does it. There's times I've written that check and given it to God and God has prompted my heart and, and I know I didn't have enough money to take care of me the rest of the month. But we made it through. 
That's God. God uses difficulties and demands and He uses dollars. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Would you look there with me please? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is uh, chapter 8 and 9 are both chapters about giving. He's encouraging the church at Corinth here and they're giving. And he challenges them here in chapter 8 and verse number 7. He says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. That's the grace of giving. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now I find out that that how I handle my money doesn't just test my faith, it proves the sincerity of my love. It tests both our love and our faith. And, and he compared, he's challenging them by the forwardness of others. He said, I want you to look and see the others here, the Macedonians. When you read the first part of chapter 8, it says they, these folks gave out of their abund- they gave abundantly out of their poverty. And yet they gave generously to the work of God. He challenges them. Look at their sacrifice. Look at their giving to help the poor. Look at what they're giving to serve the Lord. And he says, do you love God like that? Our giving indicates our love for God. Jesus put it this way, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's where your heart is. The only, you know some, the only people ever get upset about giving are those people who don't give. You know who doesn't have a problem with this at all right now? People who give. It's actually an encouragement and a blessing. To those who don't want to give, and by the way, that's not a reflection of your money. That's not a reflection of your wallet. It's a reflection of your heart. God's testing us. Every time you give to God, your faith grows. Your faith grows. Every time I give to God, it will help break the grip of materialism. Boy, we need that in America. I grow in faith. I grow in maturity. It builds my life. I rejoice continually. I obey immediately. I give generously. As God tests my faith. Number four. God tests our faith through delays. Delays. You understand, if every prayer were instantly answered, if, if every need was automatically met, if every problem were instantly solved, we wouldn't need any faith at all. It would all be done. It would all be taken care of. And our faith would never have to be stretched. Our faith would never have to be increased. We would never have to grow in faith. But it's not that way, is it? We have to wait on things. We have to continue to ask God for things. We have to continue to wait. There's not many people that say, boy, I just love waiting. In fact, in fact, we're going out to eat today and I hope we go to somewhere that's real crowded and I have to wait like an hour. There's nobody who talks that way. Nobody likes to wait. Oh, I went to the doctor's office the other day. It was so wonderful. I waited two hours. What a blessing. Nobody says that. God wants us to wait. How many of you have ever had the experience in traffic and at Columbus, it's real easy to, to, to figure out, you know, you're, it's rush hour and the lanes are all blocked and you're just creeping along and, 
It always seems like the one you're not in moves faster than the one you're in. Until you switch lanes. And then what happens? Yeah, the one you're in goes faster than the one you're in. Ever had that experience? And we're always trying to go. Why do we do that? We don't want to wait. We don't want to, we don't want to, we want to get on, get, get going. We hate to wait. But yet a large percentage of our life is spent waiting. And if we're not willing to wait on God, if we're not willing to wait patiently for Him, we're missing out on God growing our faith, stretching us a little bit. And so often in America, when we're so used to instant gratification, we don't wait. We got credit, man. We can go get it if we want it. And eventually it gets us. We don't get it. Amen? God grows us through waiting. Waiting. Again, if you go back to the people of Israel in the Old Testament, they're on their way to Egypt from the Promised Land. I understand from reading that you can make the trip from Egypt to where they enter into the Promised Land in, in, in probably two to three weeks. It's all longer it would have taken. All the further the distance that traveled in. How long did it take them? Forty years. Most of you know if you know the if you've seen the maps or geography, they just went in circles for forty years. Kind of like when you're, you know, your husband's driving on vacation and he knows a shortcut. And you say, Didn't we pass that before? They just passed the same things for forty years. But you understand, God was not only judging those who, by the way, wouldn't enter in by faith. They, they went by their sight, not by faith. But God's also stretching their faith and getting them to increase their faith. Sometimes we like just getting from point A to point B as fast as we can. And God's more interested in the process of getting us from point A to point B and developing us faith in us. And we don't like it sometimes that He doesn't take us the direct route. But God's taking us the route that's going to develop our faith. In fact, listen to Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. God said this, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or no. That's what God makes us wait for. What's He doing? He's proving our heart. He's seeing what's in here. You ever, you ever felt like you're in a hurry and you realize God isn't? We, we want it now, but God's not interested in that. God's more interested in growing our faith than just giving us the answer. So we start asking when questions. When is this going to get better? When is my marriage going to turn around? When am I going to find the right person to marry? When am, when am I going to ever be well? When will I find the right job? God is developing your faith. God uses difficulties. God uses demands. God uses dollars. And God uses delays. Isaiah 64, verse 4. The Bible says, Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, what He hath prepared for them that waiteth for Him. God says, you have yet to see what I could give you if you wait for Me. 
Sometimes I, I, I'm sure I've missed some good things that God wanted me to have because I went ahead and took what I thought I should take right now. Waiting is faith in God working in your life. It's God work. It's God working in you and me. So if I really want to learn to live by faith and to walk by faith and increase my faith, I've got to learn to rejoice continually, even in difficulties. I've got to learn to obey immediately. I have to learn to give generously. And I have to learn to wait patiently. You know, God doesn't just snap His fingers and instantly answer our prayers. Oh, sometimes. And that's exciting. But most times, that's not what happens. Because He wants us to grow in faith. Lord, the disciples said, increase our faith. Do you know what happens when you pray that prayer? Are you willing to pray that prayer this morning? Are you willing to bow your head and say, God, increase my faith, knowing that it means difficulty, demands, dollars, and delays? But what is it that pleases God? Well, God just wants me to be happy. Where, where's that verse again? You know what God's more interested in? That you walk by faith. That we walk by faith and not by sight. He's interested in growing our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I'll, I'll submit to you, a byproduct of living by faith will be your happiness you're looking for. But you're not going to get it by trying to be happy and make that the goal. Make your goal living by faith. Because when I live by faith, that pleases God. Isn't that what I'm trying to do? Please Him. And you know what? If He's pleased, I'm happy. I'm happy. Maybe God's testing your faith. Maybe there's something that... Maybe He's doing it through difficulties and you have to realize, God, you're in control and I'm going to praise you and rejoice that you're involved in my life. Maybe it's through demands. Maybe there's some demands you know God is... Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's being a member. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's something you know God wants you to do and you're just saying, no, nah, I don't think I'm ready for that. Maybe you need to pray, Lord, help me to obey immediately. Maybe God's testing your faith through dollars. Maybe God spoke to your heart that you need to at least begin to tithe. That that belongs to God. And, and, and you're, you're, you're arguing right now. Even when I say that, your mind's saying, you don't know how little money I make. You don't know how tight things are. You don't know my obligations. Well, don't tell me. Tell God. God, I, I don't, I'm not sure you're telling God anything He doesn't know, but you can tell Him. The point is, it's faith. He's testing our faith. He wants to see how we react. Maybe you'll face the test of delay. Something you've been expecting God to do in your life and He hasn't done it yet. You've been thinking that it should have happened by now, but it hasn't happened. God, when? God, how long? God, what, 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 what? Why hasn't it happened yet? Why haven't you answered my prayer? Why am I still waiting? It's a test of delay. Are you willing to pray this morning? Lord, increase my faith that I may be pleasing to you. I hope you are. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your involvement in our life. Thank you that you desire 
to grow our faith, and you do that by testing us. The trying of our faith. And Lord, that's hard for us because we want to be comfortable. We don't, we kind of balk at the difficulties and the demands and the dollars and the delays. But Lord, I pray today that we'll have a different perspective on those things. That these are the, the devices, the, this is what you use to develop our faith. To increase our faith. That we might be pleasing to you. We were created for your pleasure. And I pray you would teach us this morning and there would be many in this room who would say, Lord, increase my faith. I'll walk by faith, not by sight. Help us, Lord, to rejoice continually, to obey immediately, to give generously, and to wait patiently. And allow you to grow our faith. 